Well, good morning, Chapel family. How are you doing this morning? Before we get into the Word, I have a little bit of a business thing. Did anyone lose a brown fossil watch in the parking lot? Nobody? Nobody? That's so cool. I just found a brown fossil watch in the parking lot. It'll be at guest services if you hear of someone that did lose that. Uh, we'll keep it there for them for 90 days. Is that like the rule before we get to auction it off and, and use that for blood money for something? Anyway, uh, one last thing. I thought this was really cool. As many of you know, um, if you're new here, my name is Ryan and I'm your pastor. I've only been here for just about four months now. On my very first Sunday, Easter Sunday, a couple that attended the church that I came from in Los Angeles was here visiting. And as they were visiting, they were taking pictures of our campus. And I didn't know what they were doing. I thought they just kind of liked it. And they went back and they showed the picture of our original prayer wall to the quilting ministry because there's a group of gals out there that love quilting. And they got together and they quilted this version of our prayer wall. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, man, I was so thankful for that. So apparently they were praying and thanking God for all the answered prayers. Those are the stars on top. And then the unanswered prayers were the ones that we were still hoping on God for. If you have a prayer request, be sure to put that on the prayer wall. Anytime during service, after service, before service, during the midweek when you can break in and get on the wall. We'd love to have the opportunity to pray for you and your family and your family's needs. And now, let's get into God's Word. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 if you have a Bible. If you do not have a Bible, uh, there's Bible apps on your phone. I used to tell people that I love the sound of, of pages flipping and that was my favorite sound as a pastor, but now most of you use U version, so I just love the warm glow of the Bible upon your chin. Um, but if you'd like a real Bible, not a fake Bible, they, we have Bibles in the back. If you don't own one, that is our gift to you. You can take one of those home. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Let us pray as we get into God's Word. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your eternal perspective. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that fills us and empowers us and changes us to be more like your son, Jesus. I pray that today would not be a day where we play church, but a day where we embrace our identity as your church, your spotless bride. Help us to be changed. Fill this place. Speak through your word and get my feeble thoughts out of the way so that your transforming power can change lives forever. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you guys like before and after shows, videos, pictures? You've seen those? Okay, I love before and after. It doesn't matter what it is. I love before and after houses, like that show Extreme Home Makeover, right? They take old and busted, and they make it, as Will Smith would say, the new hotness. And I love that moment where they took the house, and that guy named Ty goes, move that bus. And it's this family that's usually been down and out, some sickness, something going on. And the bus moves, and the kids just burst into tears, and they just run for the house. It's so exciting. I love before and after. I love it. I love before and after um, pictures for health. Because every once in a while, I get on a health kick like every three or four years between bacon kicks. I bacon kick, health kick, bacon kick, health kick. And when I'm on a health kick, I'll go on Pinterest and I'll try to find that inspirational thing. I love before and after pictures. I know you can't tell, but I used to be, be a little bit bigger. I played basketball in the high school. I broke my ankle. But when I broke my ankle, I stopped playing basketball, obviously, because I had a bro broken ankle. But I still ate like a basketball player. Like we have this restaurant called In-N-Out. It's, it's the burger place for the gods. Um, you don't have it here. I apologize. It's the best. If you go to California, just do it and say animal style. And then you'll thank me later. You'll write me a letter from wherever you're at. And these burgers, you can get what's called a double-double which is two meat, two cheese, buns, and then animal style is extra sauce and grilled onions. Now, I would go and I would say I would like two double-doubles, two fries, a chocolate shake, and a Sprite. And as a growing boy, I mean, many of you are parents of growing boys, you know that that's not unheard of, right? Like, you've got a teenage boy, sure, four beef patties, four slices of cheese, 5,000 buns, 10,000 calories, you may as well wash it down with a shake. Now, I don't do that anymore. But at that phase in my life, I kept eating that way. And I got up to where I was about 250 or so pounds before I realized, man, I'm eating a lot of double-doubles and I'm not playing basketball anymore. So then I got into that health kick phase, before and after. And I wanted to, to be the after. Now, now here's something that really has been pressing on me. And as many of you know, I have weird things that I do. One of the things that I've done for a long, long time is I go to cemeteries and I journal in cemeteries. I know what you're thinking if you're new here, like this guy is creepy as I'll get out. I do it because I'm a pastor. And because there's a before and after 
that matters, not just in my line of work, but in your life today, and it matters more than, I think, anything else that we're thinking about. See, many of us are living for this life, for today, for this week, and I get that. But at the end of our life here, I think there is a vastly more important perspective that matters. The before and after that we are aiming at today, and the reason I have to preface this text with this concept of before and after is because I'm, I'm raising my kids not to be successful adults when they're 20, 30, 40, and 50. I'm raising my kids to be successful when they're 400,053 years old. I'm trying to love my wife not so that she can be happy into her 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm trying to, to nurture and love and pour into my wife so that when my wife is 700,000 years old, she'll say, thank you, Thank you for what you did there. And that is my goal today. Because we're going to read a passage in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that if we don't have this before and after perspective, this perspective of life being more than 78 years, give or take, then this passage will sound, I kid you not, absolutely insane. Absolutely insane. So let's jump in to God's text, and you're going to see what I mean. The Holy Spirit has come. Peter preached his sermon. He said, Jesus is the Son of God, lived the perfect life, died for you. And the people, it said, were cut to the heart, and they believed, were baptized, they repented, and were baptized. That means they were, they were taken into their new identity. They were buried to their old flesh and sin, and they were raised with Christ. And now look at the type of people that this produced. Verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and we came, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing, them, uh, distributing the proceeds to all as any has need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now this is a picture of the church. And being in ministry, you hear people say, we want to be an Acts 2 church. An Acts 2 church. This is what they mean. They want to be a church that has been filled with the Holy Spirit and changed to this radical new community of people. And when we look at passages like this, it, it sort of seems idyllic. The Spirit comes, Peter preaches a sermon, they go from 120 to 3,000 people in one day, and then they become this people who devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devote themselves to the breaking of bread. They see someone in need and they say, I'll sell my car, I'll sell my house, I'll sell my land, because they have a need. They need food, they need help with this, they need help with that. And it was this radical body of believers, and this is what shook the world. This is the type of people that when other people looked at them, they said, I may not agree with you, but I am all for that type of life. Now here's where it gets tricky. Sometimes in Christianity, we make up weird sort of rules to get out of doing what the Bible simply commands us to do. We, we study the rules. We examine the rules. We read the rules in every language that they were written in. And we say, well, I memorized all the rules but we really struggle with this concept of devotion. So let's just go through the list. This is going to be one of those days where we can look at our lives and we say, okay, am I playing the game or am I connected with God? Because if you're just playing the religious game, you're going to find it very difficult to be this way. But if you are connected with the living God and his Holy Spirit is in you, it is in that moment that you'll finally be able to see what, what we're talking about with this before and after in this radical new community. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, I, I know a lot of people I know myself. I know what I'm devoted to. It is hard to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. If you've never tried to read the book of Leviticus at one in the morning, you, you know what I'm talking about. Because sometimes we read this Bible and it's like our attention bounces off the pages of this book and goes to every other thing in our lives. And we think, well, maybe the Bible's just boring. But maybe we haven't thought one step further. Maybe spiritual warfare exists. Because some people tell me, Ryan, I'm just not a good reader. I just don't like reading. But all of a sudden, I can give them a book with pictures or, or an article in a Sports Illustrated, and we can read for days and days and days. Have you ever wondered why you can pick up an app and read an article about sports and you never get distracted once? 
And then all of a sudden you put that down, you pick up your Bible, and every errand you've had for the last 20 years floods into your mind. It's spiritual warfare. Because Satan does not want us to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Satan does not want us to be devoted to the word of God. The disciples were devoted to this word because they were obsessed with it. And they followed and obeyed what it did. And I know that you guys all know how to obey. We've done this uh, once before, I believe. Do you remember? Okay, ready? Clap with me. Ready? One, two, three. Clap on rhythm. See, look at that. Look how good you guys are at obeying. I should become a dog trainer or something. That was spectacular. Now, how weird would it have been if I said, okay, clap with me, and some guy next to you, instead of clapping, just went like this. Clap, 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 clap. I didn't say yell clap with me. I said clap with me. But sometimes in Christianity, what we do is we say, well, the Bible says, says this, so let's just talk about it forever. Like, I, I don't need to actually devote myself to the word. I don't need to devote myself to the breaking of bread. I'm just going to keep talking about it and talking about it. And the scary thing happens. If you talk about something long enough, you actually think in your mind that you're doing it. And you start to believe that talking about it is all that God wants and not being devoted to it. But this is radical because... Let's be honest, some shows to watch on Netflix are way more entertaining than reading the Bible at times. And I'm just confessing that as your pastor. Like there are moments where when I go home, I would rather kick up my feet, put on an episode of Psych and laugh at Sean and Gus, if you don't know who they are, you're welcome, for a solid 45 minutes than I would to open up God's word. And I know right now some of you are thinking, well, geez, you're my pastor and you're that much of a heathen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because what I'm doing in a lot of those moments is I'm forgetting the true before and after. I'm not doing for my, my own soul what I'm striving to do for my wife and my kids. I'm not saying 500,000 years from now, what's going to matter? A million years from now, what is going to matter? 10 million years from now, what is going to matter? Because at the end of this all, I'm going to be really old, you guys. Like, we joke about it, you know, I've, I've been told funny things about being a young pastor. Someone once told me that they have a pair of shoes older than me. I was like, that's awesome, get new shoes. But at the end of the day, I think it's really cool that, like, Moses is the geezer, and we all went to high school together, right? Like, that's the, the lifespan. Because when it's been 10,000 years, like, I'm 10,034, and then Ken's, like, 10,050, Seems a lot closer then, right? I, I'm kind of pumped for that. And today, I, I need you guys to understand that when we pour into this book, when we say, God, if I have your spirit, I should be this type of person, then we also have to say the other question on the other side of that coin. God, I don't want to do this. Maybe I'm not living by your spirit or I do not have your spirit. Now, here's what else they did. I don't want to just focus on that, but it is important that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching because every word of this is breathed out by God. Secondly, they were devoted to fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. So who likes eating here? Right? Eating is so much fun. I think God was a genius when he did this. He said, I'm going to make a creation and they're going to get hungry all the time. Now, maybe they'll go eat together and share a meal with each other because in the moments of sharing meals, that's when relationships are bonded. If you don't believe me, take somebody that you're mad at out to lunch or dinner. Just do it. Try it one time. Maybe it's a coworker that like, oh man, I just don't want to see them. I'm so mad at them. Take them out to lunch or dinner. Pray for the food and thank God for their life. And all of a sudden, you're going to start to see, I, I just love this person a little bit more if they don't do anything crazy at that lunch. You know why that is? Because food makes us happy. And food, when we're eating it, as it's making us happy, as we're staring at the person that we don't like, all of a sudden, all this emotion of joy and fulfillment and satisfaction that God wired into eating is getting shared in that conversation. Which is why I'm totally pro all of our Sunday school teachers feeding my kids sugar. I'm like, hey, if you want to say Jesus is awesome and then give my kid a Tootsie Roll so that he's got a, man, Jesus is awesome, he tastes good, I'm all for that. I don't think it's manipulative. I think it's what God created food to do and to be. Everything pointing back to him. The disciples were devoted to this. They were devoted to fellowship. That's a church word that we use. There's a, there's a funny marketing thing that happened in the 90s. Every church marketed with the same three F words. It was always family, fun, and fellowship. And it would be on banners and we'd be all pumped. Family, fun, and fellowship. Now, I don't want to miss this word. It doesn't just mean hanging out. 
It doesn't just mean walking along the street. It means that their lives were getting connected. It means like, like a spider web. You couldn't tell oftentimes where one ended and the other began and the turns were all interwoven. This is the type of lives that the disciples were living. When the Spirit came into them, they were getting so connected, you couldn't tell where one person ended and the next began. Because one loving hand would stretch into the next loving hand and they would be serving and sharing all that they had. Man, and here it is. Awe came upon every soul. If you haven't been able to tell yet, I, I still haven't kicked a lot of my California language. Um, some of the words I use aren't from California, so if you, you hear me say the word rad a lot, that's a word that came around in the 80s and I never let it go. And even my friends in California make fun of me, like, let it go, Ryan. I'm like, no, it's so rad. Um, my daughter's a shirt that says I'm rad on it because it's a good word. Now, there's a word that I love, and it's the word awesome. Awesome. I love it and I hate it. I hate it because I hear it all the time about words or about things that it should not be awesome. My son does it uh, unintentionally now because I think I've done it a few times, but he'll be sitting at lunch with us eating a piece of pizza and he'll say, Dad, this pizza's awesome. And I'll be like, son, it is not awesome. Does that pizza strike awe into your heart? No, it's just really good. Then say really good. But it's awesome. It's not awesome. Because awe is this sense of wonder mixed with fear, mixed with anticipation. And the disciples' lives were so radical, they were filled with such awe that awe came upon every soul. Signs and wonders were being done. It's the, it, that's when we use the word awesome. When we baptize somebody up here, I want somebody to stand up and say, awesome! When we hear a story of, getting, of someone getting saved and making that first-time decision to follow Jesus or recommit, that's when we say, Awesome! When somebody's sick and we pray for their cancer and they're healed of it, we say, that's awesome. When we have a piece of pizza, we say, that's decent. <laughs> because there has to be a differentiation between what's truly awe-inspiring and what just is pizza and life and stuff that's not awesome. Now, the question is, if the Spirit is in us and working through you and you've embraced Jesus, is the life that you're living looking like this picture? Because this is a picture of the after. This is a picture of what we're going to be like from about 78 till 500 million. This is that picture, and it's a foretaste. It's a sample. I went to an ice cream store recently called Menchie's. It was delicious. It's fill up your own cup as much as you want, and I don't know what the deal was that day. It was $5. And the lady was kind enough to tell me at the counter, I filled up my cup like this much, and she goes, oh, it's $5 all you can fill up. And I'm like, does that mean I can go high, as high as I want? She's like, yes. And I took my cup back off the scale, and I went back and I filled it back up. And I mean, I just, we got as much yogurt as I could get, and I was putting little toppings on it. Now, the thing is, with ice cream and me, I mean, you guys, I have a problem. I eat so fast, and I eat so much. I think it's because my mouth is big. I know you're looking at me, and you're thinking, your mouth doesn't look big. It's because I'm six foot six, and my mouth looks average, which means my mouth fits a giant frame which fits a lot of food. And you can ask everyone in my family, I don't know why I do this. I think it's because I grew up a little bit on the poor end. There were times when we didn't have food, but I was taught never leave food on the plate. And even to this day, I've not gone hungry intentionally for decades. I cannot stop eating once I start. My wife will amen this. I will, if food gets in front of me, I put my head down and then my arm just becomes like a motor wheel. And then I'm done and I'm like, why aren't you guys eating? Food might run out, you know? And if there's any, seriously, this, this is how it goes down. But at these ice cream places, they kill me because they give me a taste. And you've seen the cups. They're like cups for undersized Oompa Loompas. <laughs> and you can't even fill that little cup without getting ice cream all over your hand. At least I can't, but it's okay because I just do it like Winnie the Pooh. But, but I taste, oh, that's so good. But they have this whole platter of tiny cups for miniature people. And I, and I keep, and I get another cup. I'm like, i got to try all the flavors. Now, here's what we're supposed to be for the world. We are, as, as much as we can be by the power of God's Spirit in us, that sample cup. And there are a hundred thousand different sample cups. 
There's, there's a body of people called Buddhists, and there's a body of people called Hindus. There's a body of people called secular humanists. There's a body of people, and they're all sampling their wares, and people are tasting them and saying, I kind of like this. I like this flavor about that. This is a little too fruity. This is a little too nutty, a little too chocolatey. Christianity, the cup that we're supposed to be sampling and being a foretaste of, is this picture of a people that are so obsessed with God that were like, I just... I want to learn more about not this book because it's knowledge, but because this book bounces me to God. I want to be in prayer because it's when I'm in prayer that I feel like all of my worries melt away. And when I'm in prayer, it feels like this struggle with this child, this struggle with this job, this fear about the future, it all gets put in its place. Now, this radical people that were devoted to the teaching, this radical people that were together, they were interconnected in fellowship, this radical people through which signs and wonders were being performed, did something even more radical. All who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now this is, either you're, you're thinking that's insane, or you're thinking that sounds like socialism. But, but here's the difference. Socialism is a government saying you have to do this. Christianity is the spirit of life saying you have such a magnificent existence ahead of you. Who needs what you have? How cheap are the things that you're holding on to in light of eternal treasures? How cheap are these temporary things that will fade in light of grabbing the ultimate treasure of Jesus Christ? I do it all the time. You do it all the time. And this is the cure that the Spirit came for was to get into our life and from the inside out change our desires so that finally it becomes easier for us to say, well, well this house, my, my house over in Riverview, River Creek Haven, wherever, man, that thing, it's like literally two days away from being exploded by a lightning bolt or a sinkhole or a hurricane. Like pick your crazy Florida thing that kills houses, cockroaches, I don't know what kills houses, you everything. And I put so much time and energy and money into it. We get our, our mortgage and our electric bill and our water bill and our food bill just to feed the humans that I made that live in that house. And I think, man, this stuff is all going to pass so soon. So, so what can I get rid of? What can I open my hands on? And right here, what, what makes it so radical is that they open their hands to everything. Now, I, I've, I read a lot of books. I, I love being part of a church family. And I've been thinking this week, what does it mean to be a church family? You've heard me say, we are a church family. Good morning, Chapel family. I love that we're the family. But then I realized that I was being unfair to you. You see, um, a family is, is totally open and honest. And it doesn't mean that we all have to be open and honest with each other, but I, I feel like there, there should be a level of trust here. And I'm doing something that goes against a lot of what I've learned in seminaries and Bible schools because I, I really do believe that God wants us to be a family. So, uh, so I just want to kind of let my hair down metaphorically and say, as your pastor, I love you. I'm already literally going gray for you. I'm pretty sure my hair is falling out faster for you. And, and if it means that I go totally bald and gray-haired and die at the age of 40, I would gladly do that for you, gladly. But I'm not going to play pastor from afar. And I know that in churches they say, well, you've got to keep that separation because there's crazy people. Absolutely there's crazy people. I think I'm one of them. So here's the thing. Because I'm only one human, I, I'm not omnipresent, but I want to be your pastor. And, and this is the only time we can do this. If we get like literally one person larger than we are today, I couldn't do this. But if you need to call me for anything, you can call me. In seminary they say, don't give your phone number out to your people. Somebody crazy is going to call you at one in the morning. I call that person my mother. Not because I want you to call me, necessarily, because I want to be your shepherd and I want to be available to you. If you need prayer, man, I love to pray. I don't have a lot of the spiritual gifts. All of us in here have spiritual gifts and we all just have a few of them. One of the ones that I think I do have is that when I pray, God seems to hear me and God seems to do things. So if you're struggling, if you're like, I've prayed for this, it's not, I'm not, nothing's happening, I'm just going to text Pastor Ryan, call me, man, could you pray for this? Or if you have a question about the Bible, I got a question. I was reading this book in the Bible this guy sounds crazy. Why are they killing people in the Old Testament? And not in the New? You can call me. I just gave you my number. There you go. I did what all my professors told me not to do. Be open and vulnerable and make myself accessible at all times. Well, it's yours. Because this community here, th this tells me that I, 
I don't want to be like any church on the block. I want to be the church that God has called us to be. I want to be a church with people who sit down on the couch to watch a show. And, and don't get me wrong. Keep watching your shows. Shows are cool. But I want for us to sometimes wrestle and say, is this what I need to feed my 500,000-year-old self? When I'm a million years old, well, I look back at this moment and say, that's what I needed most. And, and it might be. My wife will tell you that uh, oftentimes, and I've tried not to do this out loud as much anymore, I use shows as a reason to practice preaching the gospel. So I will preach the gospel in my head to fictional people on the TV. So they'll be living their life, and I'll be like, oh, Jerry Seinfeld, that's where I jump right in there. And I'd be like, well, here's where you need Jesus, Jerry. Boom. And I used to do it out loud, and my wife would be like, shut up, you're ruining the show. I'm like, I'm not ruining it, I'm redeeming it for the Lord. Because we're a different people. If the Spirit is in you, you will be devoted to the teaching. You will be devoted to this interconnected life. You will get to the place where all of a sudden you see yourself 400,000 years from now or just 400 years from now and you say, man, what I get there is so insanely incredible and awe-inspiring. I don't, I don't need to hold on to all this stuff. I don't need to lie and to cheat to get more in this life. I, I don't need to fib on my taxes. I don't need to do this with my time because look at all the time that I get. Now, I'd be remiss to, to point out that some people have a fear of heaven. I, I want to let you know one thing. Heaven is going to be spectacular. If you think that it's you singing Kumbaya for 10,000 years with a harp with chubbier cheeks and angel wings, you're like so far from, from the actual picture of heaven because that literally sounds like hell to me. Like I'd rather... I know I wouldn't rather. I, yeah, I don't know. Because heaven is when all of sin is removed. Heaven was when everything that, that sin has influenced in this life is finally taken away, not just from our bodies, but from creation. Like my eyes are going bad now. My hair is falling out or rather migrating to my shoulders. All these things are going to be reversed. The effects of sin are redeemed. The relationships that have tension are going to be tension-free. We're going to know each other and be loved. We're going to see each other as we truly are and as Jesus died for us and say, man, isn't it amazing that we're here? Do you remember when we were studying Acts chapter 2 together, talking about being 400,000-year-olds, and now we're 400,000-year-olds? This is the taste that we are to be. They devoted themselves. They distributed their proceeds so that nobody in the church had needs. They attended temple together, breaking bread in their homes, and they received their food with glad and generous hearts. If you have never prayed as a family, the best place to start praying is over a meal. It's to simply say, thank you, God, for this food. Thank you, God, for these people. My son Silas, he's my rebellious wild child. I was, he was sleeping yesterday on Facebook, and I made him say a conversation with his mouth. I got in trouble with a lot of you for that one. He thought I was being cruel. I thought I was being a dad. Uh, but Silas, every time you pray with him, and if, if you see Silas or go to lunch with us, you'll, you'll see this. Say, hey guys, let's pray. Silas doesn't even wait for you to pray. In Christian circles, we do this thing where you put your thumbs up and whoever's last has to pray. I used to love praying, so I'd be like this. I'm praying. Silas doesn't even do that. We say, okay, let's pray for our food. He'll be like, dear God. And, and literally, I never ask him to pray if we're having steak or bacon or anything because he goes on forever. He's like the kid that would not shut up because he'll thank God for everything. But, but I was so humbled the other day because I was hungry and we were praying. And, and he does this thing. Dear God, thank you for our food. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for faith. Thank you for spirit. Thank you for daddy. Thank you for mommy. <gasps> thank you for Bubba. Thank you for... And I'm like, just finish. And I'll try to chime in. I'm like, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. No, daddy, it's my turn. Thank you for... And he'll, sometimes he'll repeat it. And then he'll go through all of the Disney rides that he's thankful for. Good Lord, pastor's kids are the worst. <laughs> but he's devoted to prayer. He loves to pray. Man, if, if you're in here today and you're like, well, okay, Ryan, we've been talking a lot about Jesus in the book of John. We've been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. And now you're saying that if the Holy Spirit's in me, the type of foretaste that I'm going to be is this giving, generous, devoted, Bible-centered, Spirit-filled person, but I just don't see that. I just don't know that I even want that. How do I get that? This is the miracle of the Holy Spirit. 
that, that when he is in us, he will start to produce these things from the inside out. So if you want to find out, there's a few things you could do. First, you can say, okay, how often do I want to pray? Because if you're finding yourself never wanting to pray, it may be a sign that you're not connected. Okay, I'm going to do something just for, for the nerdy people and the curious. We have this, trinity, this doctrine called the Trinity. The Trinity is the Godhead. Three persons, one God. If you grew up Catholic, you know it as the prayer, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. If you grew up in the Protestant church, you know the, the Trinity as we talk about God a lot, Jesus the most, and the Holy Spirit every once a month or two months. Now, here, here's how the Trinity works in a very simplistic way. God the Father, God in his being, is there, transcending all time and space, the creator of all things. When the Father, when God the Father moves in speaking, the spoken word, it is the Son. The essence of God moving is uniquely the person of the Son. Prior to him being born in a body, he was called the Word of God. So in the beginning, God, Elohim, it's a word that actually means God, plural, spoke. And when he spoke, that was the sun emanating forth. And as creation happened, the spirit then hovered over the waters. And a few of my favorite authors, Jonathan Edwards, old dead guy, really smart. C.S. Lewis, old dead guy, really smart. Talked about God the Father and God the Son. And their communication between each other and the essence of their unity was so strong, it was the Holy Spirit of God. And all of them are unique in personhood, but one in essence and being. And this spirit that is the connection, the flow, the encouragement, the love between God the Father and God the Son is in you if you believe in Jesus Christ. So when we say God is love, we're not just saying that he is a generally loving being because humans existed. God was love before any human beings existed. Because within his personhood, there is constant love and encouragement and joy and exaltation and lifting up. And that spirit is in you. So wouldn't it be weird if that spirit that's been eternally loving, eternally encouraging, eternally joyful, eternally connecting, if he was in you and you're none of those things? You're, you'd rather just never share. You'd rather never engage. You'd rather just to go hide and watch from far away as God does something over there. And say, God, there's a, there's a door here. Please don't come in. Because here, here's what I promise you. That spirit, if you go home today and you say, God, I, I don't know that I have this spirit. I don't know that I've trusted your son Jesus. I think I've just looked at ideas about Jesus and I've, I've learned all these do's and don'ts, but I've never said, God, I just want to be with you. Be with me. Make that your prayer. If today I had to start from ground zero, as I do most days, <laughs> my prayer would be, God, I want to be with you. Because when I'm with him, when I'm journaling in a cemetery, when I'm preaching about the idyllic church gathering here in Acts chapter 2, when I'm having coffee with you, when I'm shaking your hand or giving you a hug on the way out, I want to encourage you toward one thing, that this Spirit of God could give you an, an eternal perspective, a, a five million year old perspective, where you've, you've already climbed most of the mountains and the new heavens and the new earth. You've dipped your foot in the crystal rivers. You've eaten mangoes that are untainted by sin. You've eaten Brussels sprouts and they might have even tasted good. You've seen your old enemies in Christ who are now your deepest of friends. You've ridden on wild animals because we have dominion over them once again, as in the garden. You've enjoyed the sun shine and not had a sun burn in 10,000 years. You sang Kumbaya just a few times before you moved on to singing with that singer from the famous band that you thought was a total heathen, but Jesus saved by grace. You bump into your spouse and relive the precious memories of hanging out on Anna Maria Island, eating at the sandbar. And you walk alongside Moses, and you say, what was it like when you threw those tablets down? And you look at Jesus, and he looks at you with eyes filled with eternal love and says, I'm so glad you're here. I knew you'd be here. 
because I'm the author and the perfecter of faith. I authored your faith and I brought it to completion. I knew you'd be here because I ran the race because I knew you couldn't. I knew you'd be here because because this plan we hatched for you, this plan that that me and the Father and the Spirit, we hatched it, that I would go and die and that the Father's love would, would send me so that his wrath could be absorbed and then this, this Spirit that we have, we'd be like, you know what, we're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to put our Spirit in people. You know, when Jesus died and did all this and made this community, he was answering his own prayer in John 17. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. Man, Jesus prayed this in the garden right before he died. God, I want my my disciples, those who will believe, to be one as you and I are one. How are we going to do it? We're going to fill them with our own presence. And they're going to be something that the world has never seen. A house burnt down over here this last week. That's really sad. Another shooting happened. As I would mentioned, since I've been a pastor, I don't think we've gone many weeks without shootings happening. It's very sad. Which is why I stand before you as your pastor saying, whatever I can do to help you be a satisfied, joy-filled, 500,000-year-old, I want to do it. And I only have 168 hours in a week. I've got to sleep a little, eat a little, love my family a lot. But I will carve out time for you. Facebook, search for Ryan Tyrona. There's two of us. We're both Filipinos. One of us looks Filipino. The other looks like a white giant. Twitter, don't tweet at me. It's where I hide from people. But I'm here to love you well so that 500 year, years from now and a million years from now, you'll look back and say, I'm glad that my pastor made me a faithful old man or old woman. I'm glad that he taught me how to be a a foretaste. And he set me up that if I'm not that foretaste, to cry out to God to give me his spirit. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for all that you do. Lord, I could not fathom what my life would be like without your spirit in me. Lord, you know my sins, which are many. You know my greed, which at times can be great. You know my selfishness, which at times tries to wear the crown. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bring me freedom and that you would bring these people freedom. I pray that we would be a body of believers who have the ultimate 500,000 year plan in place. Because like I have discovered, Lord, when I'm living for eternity, my present becomes the most beautiful and freeing that it's ever been. When I think about spending eternity with you and all that you've given us in Christ, the way that I can love my wife today is freed because I don't have to win anymore. I can just love. So I pray that you would give everyone that reality today so that they could experience all that you have for them when fears melt away when worries melt away, when desire to be the king melts away, and we look up to you, our loving Savior. In Jesus' name.